and we need the rain, but uh, it sure is good to see the sun shining and uh, the flowers poking out, amen, the birds are singing, all of God's creation giving him praise for life, amen, and uh, the Bible says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, amen, I mean, that's uh, that's us, that's uh, the the animal kingdom, everything that's got breath, amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, you can even watch them little old squirrels first thing of a morning with them nuts. It's just like they bow their head and say, Father, I thank you for this nut I'm about to eat. And uh, that's right, amen. <laughs> uh, I think sometimes creation knows more about the God in heaven than a lot of people. Uh, where they'll at least acknowledge him, at least acknowledge him. Uh, the Bible tells us in all of our ways as believers, in all of our ways, to acknowledge him, to acknowledge him, and he shall direct our path. We should to acknowledge him in all of our ways is to say, God, we know that uh, you're in our lives, you oversee our life, and uh, God, we we need your will. We ask for your will. Uh, when we acknowledge him, we acknowledge his ways. Amen. And uh, I want to I want to be in his way, don't you? Amen. The straight and the narrow way. Praise the Lord. Good to have everybody here. Let's be much in prayer today uh, for the sick. <clears throat> Brother Ernie back there has mentioned uh, some cancer patients that are uh, in, in pretty pitiful shape right now, and we want to remember them and, uh, of course, other, other sick people. Good to have Brother Wilson back with us. Amen. Amen. And uh, thank the Lord for uh, his healing. And uh, I wanted to make mention to you the prayers that uh, God's people have been praying uh, for uh, <clears throat> Maggie's father-in-law, his nephew we prayed for that was uh, in that burn accident, the trailer exploded. Um, miraculously, they're saying that his burns are not as bad as what they first thought. And, uh, you know, God... I, 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 I believe the Lord, don't you? Uh, they look at burn patients all the time, and they can tell just what kind of shape they're in. And they wasn't giving him a whole lot of hope. And it seems like the Lord has, uh, has done something uh, to, where, to where he's going to pull out of this thing. Amen. So uh, thank the Lord for answering prayer. And uh, keep praying for him because he needs the Lord. And, uh, you know, God will give somebody uh, a day of grace, doesn't he? he? God opens the door. God extends his hand. God's very long-suffering. Well, he was long-suffering to me. I don't know how many times I went to the altar trying to get saved before I really just, I knew I needed to be saved and he was going to have to do the saving. And... Uh, I knew I wanted that more than I did anything. I didn't want to go to hell. And, but God's long-suffering hand, it was just stretched out to me for some time. But, uh, you know, there's been people that's went past that time. Went past that time. And I hate to know just how much uh, rejection anybody would do in this world before God would give up on them. Because He's the most merciful God there is, the most long-suffering, patient. Uh, we don't understand patience like the patience of God. But uh, the Bible said that uh, over there in the book of Genesis, my spirit shall not always strive with man. There was a day, there was a hundred, I don't know why I'm saying all this other than just trying to obey the Lord this morning. There's 120 years Noah was in building the ark. And before God finally let the rain come down and shut the door of the ark, uh, the day came. It had to come. And uh, the rapture is going to take place. Listen, there's going to be a day the last one's going to get saved and the door is going to be shut. 
And uh, it has to happen. It has to happen. And uh, God and his wisdom uh, knows when that day is, doesn't he? But man doesn't know the day. The angels in heaven doesn't know the day. But my Father in heaven, he knows the day. Amen. And today could be that day. It very well could be that day. Amen. All right, let's all stand. Brother Mike, you come and get us uh, started with some singing, would you? Forty five. I hear the Savior say, I strength in this song, child of weakness, watch and pray. Find it.
the Lord. That's what the Christian life is, living by faith. Amen. We trust Christ by faith, that he will do what he said he would do when he said he would save us. Amen. That he'd wash us from our sins in his own blood. Uh, we believe him by faith. We believe his word. Amen. Thank God. Uh, we don't have nothing else to believe in. You sure can't believe in your feelings because your feelings can fool you. But we can believe in God's word. Amen. We can th thank God we've got something that we can anchor our hope in. And uh, I'm glad that, that it is in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. All right. Brother Ronnie, would you dismiss us to Sunday school and prayer? Amen. Amen. Good to be back at the Lord's house again this morning. Let's look back in the book of John, chapter 8. Last week, we got through, or down, down around verse 40 or so. 42, we saw Jesus here is giving them this uh, exhortation, uh, answer to these Pharisees, scribes. He's trying to teach them uh, who he is and just exactly what he is. And also at the same time, he's trying to show them who they are. And he told them there in verse 24, you shall die in your sins, for if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And he's trying to show them that even though they are religious and they claim themselves to be religious, there's no difference in them and even this woman here that they had brought to him in adultery. They're, it's, it's the same. Verse 34, he told them, whosoever commit a sin is, a, is the servant of sin. So he, he gave them the answer here. That's the problem. But he gave them the answer. He said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. This is uh, uh, our freedom that we have in Christ. We talked about like that uh, last week. They said, we're Abraham's seed, verse 33. We're never in bondage to any man, yet they were. But uh, they, they didn't see that. He said, they said, how sayest Thou you shall be made free. He said, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is a servant of sin. The servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. Abideth ever. It's always been. The son, therefore, shall make you free. You shall be free indeed. So the only way they can find true freedom is in Christ. And that we, we talked about that last week. We read over there, let me just read these verses. This will kind of get us to where we're going. We saw the cost of freedom. Our first Peter chapter 1, verse 18, For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So that is... 
the, the, uh, the cost of our freedom. That's what it took. It took his life, took his precious blood, the blood that, uh, that there was nothing wrong with him. Everything was wrong with us, but he had to be the one that shed that blood and that gave his life. We saw uh, the condition there of our freedom. It's got to come through him. The Son, therefore, shall make you free. You shall be free indeed. When we get on there, John chapter, John chapter 10, he will tell us, verse 9, I'm the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. And in John chapter 9, when we get there, we'll see a picture of salvation experience, how that, that man is just as, as, he, as he has more dealings with Christ and the more that he sees Christ, the more that he understands his need. I mean, that is, that is, that is how salvation comes. That's what, that's what happens. Holy Spirit shines a light on a man and shows him, shows him, shows him what he is, shows him that he's a sinner, shows him that he's lost. That doesn't that salvation does not, you know, people don't want to be saved just because they, you know, a lot of people they 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 just, you know, they they think if they can just say they're saved that it'll it'll do something for them. Or, or a lot of people, you know, they do bad. I've seen people do bad, and they they about to get caught, and they go and they they say they get saved just so because it so, so it takes some of that guilt off of them. And and then you you know you you give them a month or two months and they're right back where they were. So that's not salvation. That's just that's just you know somebody they, they get relief from the situation uh, that they're in, maybe that they've got themselves into. Or you, I've seen people, you know, uh, I, I remember a man. He never did, never could get him to come to church. Never could get him to go anywhere. Always lived pretty rough. His wife said, "I've had enough," and she left. And the next Sunday he comes, he got saved. He's trying to get her. He's trying to get her to come back, yeah. and as last time, as far as I know, I think as last time he is ever in church again. So see, that's not that's not salvation. That's just that's just people trying to find relief from uh, from just a, a dire situation that they're in. And 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 I'll I'll have to say that uh, you know it's it's good to go to Christ look for relief, hey. but uh, but people need to realize the condition that they're in, the relief they need. See, they needed relief from their sin, their sin problem, that sin nature. He, he's going to tell them here, and we're going to look at this in a minute, that, that they are of their father, the devil. That, that, that one that, one that he, he's, he is a liar. He is sin from the very beginning. That, that's the problem that man has to deal with. And then we talked about, we talked about that freedom, uh, the change that freedom brings. Our 2 Corinthians uh, chapter, chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Hey. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Hey. So that's what salvation does. That's what salvation does. See, uh, uh, verse 14 there said, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that, all, that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth... No, we, no man after the flesh, they throw. We have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth we know him no, for, no more. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. See, there's a change made when someone's, when someone's saved. He, he, he doesn't go back. He doesn't go back to what he, the, 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 the alcohol and, and, and all the foolishness and the drugs and, the, and the, just the running around and all, the, all that stuff's old, old things. He's a, new, he's a new creature. See, that's what salvation does. Salvation deals with that in the heart of a person. That's what conviction does. It proves a person, proves a person that they're, it proves what they are. See, that's what, that's what, that's when, it, when we talk about being under conviction. That's when, that's when the Holy Spirit says, you know, you're a sinner, shows you you're a sinner. And, and, he, and he convicts you and he shows, he proves that in your heart. He proves to you what you are. And that's, 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 that's what it takes to be saved. Man, realize that he is what God said he is. That's what salvation is. When you realize you agree with God that you're exactly what he says you are. A lot of people, a lot of people try to run, you know, bargain with God. I'll, I'll do this if you'll do this, or, or I'll do this if I can still do this. A lot of people, that's why people like religion, because religion allows people to, to, to still do what they want to do 
and still talk like they got Jesus. You know, they can still drink, run around, and then they, but they can go, you know, to mass and they can get it, get it took care of, and it makes them feel good. But see, that's what Christ came. Christ came to tear down religion. See, it, it, everything, everything Christ is doing, it, he is, he is, he's, he came to the ones that's supposed to be the best of the day, the religious people here. And he he just tore everything he's doing. He just he just he just taking it apart piece by piece. Because religion religion will never get you anywhere. People say people say yeah, I got religion. Well, you know I know sometimes we don't we don't realize what we're saying. But a lot of people they say we got religion. Well, religion's not going to do us any good. But but we get salvation. That's what'll do good. That's what'll do. That's what'll do the good. So he he said he said let me let me we looked at that last week. He said. Uh, let me just read on. If the Son, verse 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed. Ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. See, that was a problem. He is the word. He's, he's got to be, he's got to take, he's got to get in you. I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto him, If you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But they didn't, see. They didn't. They didn't do the works of Abraham. They wasn't even trying. They had their own, they had their own works. They had their own thing. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. That's what happens to people when they when they tell the truth. People don't like it. The religious world doesn't like truth. See, religious world. Is, is they like their truth, they like their truth. See, that's just 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 as the just as the you know the uh, the 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 crazy liberals that you know they say we, we've got our truth. Well, that's the religious society's got their truth. This same same thing, it's just just wrapped in a different wrapped in a different package. See, the devil is the father of all lies. It doesn't matter if it's the you know you know the the the, the pink headed woman that don't know if she's a man or a woman that, and, and from one day to the next her truth's no different than, uh, than than some false prophet that has his truth see because I mean uh, we look at it and we see difference but as far as God's concerned it's all a lie see and it all come it all come from 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 Satan which is we're fixing to see that because he's the father of all lies he said you do the deeds of your father they, they, they listen, then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. So here they just, you know, they just hitting pretty low here. Because they, they said, that because, because Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, Joseph was, was, was not his father. God was father. God was his father. But they, they, they said, no doubt, you know, he was he was just born of fornication. Nobody really even knows who his father is. But Jesus said, then, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. That's where he came from. That's that's pretty that's a pretty bold statement. That's you know, but that's the truth. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Sometimes that's why we that's why we can't understand. Is because we don't want to hear. We don't want to hear. That's what you know. That's what I tell the kids sometimes. Well, I don't understand why. Well, you ain't hearing what I'm saying. That's the reason you don't understand. You won't. You won't stop and listen. That, that's what we. That's our problem. We sometimes we just don't stop and listen. We don't hear. We don't hear. Verse forty four. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. Sinners are going to sin. They're going to do wrong. You shouldn't expect anything more from a sinner for him to do wrong because he's that's what his father what his father's done. He, he's he, he said your your lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Satan is the very father of sin, very father of rebellion. He he got kicked out of heaven. For being rebellious. Hell was created for him, the devil and his angels. But because mankind abode not in the truth, now 
those that, that are not in Christ, they'll, they'll be in the same hell as the devil. That's the dangers of not abiding. Not abiding. Because he, he'd already told them uh, somewhere back there, I forget which one it was, but to, to abide, he says this a lot, abide in me, abide in the truth. See, if, you, if you do not abide in him, you will, if you're not careful, you'll, you'll find yourself walking in error, walking in lies. So Satan, Satan is a very, Satan is their father. Satan's the one, Satan's the one that is, that is leading them. See, they're just doing what their father wants. See, just as Christ is doing what the father wants, so are these, so are these Pharisees. They're doing exactly what Satan wants them to do. They're just, they're just doing, they are doing the lust of the father you will do. Nothing, nothing pleased Satan more than to kill Christ. And that's what they were doing. They were helping him. They were helping him do that. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. People, people will walk. You've heard this statement. People walk all over the truth just to find a lie. I mean, they just they, you know, they they stomp the truth in the ground just so they can find a lie. I don't understand. Well, I understand why. It's because it's because they they they're following after something that's that's not. That is a lie. They're following after the father of lies. So Satan, nobody knows how to nobody knows how to tell a lie more than Satan. I mean, he, you know, he 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 told a good enough one to get what was it, a, a third or a quarter or however many other angels it was there uh, to 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 rebel with him against God. I mean, all he had ever known, all they had ever known was 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 God, cherubims and seraphims and. Praising God, worshiping, but but he told a big enough. He spun a big enough tale, however he told it, to get to get that many of them to follow him. In the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Eden, I mean, you see what he done to Eve. He he he, he took his little look his little tale, and he just he just told it just 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 as easy and just try. You know, he 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 made Eve think he made Eve think she is gonna miss out on something. That's what the devil does. That's what he does. He's a, he's a liar. He's a liar and the father of it. You nobody tell a lie like him. And that, that's why people that people that are in sin, that's why that's why they lie. Cuz cuz they're cause they're just doing what comes natural. I mean that's why we don't lie. That's why that's why once you get saved, you don't lie, you know. If a man if man just tells lies one right after the other, he's probably not saved. Because because there's no because Jesus said I'm the way I'm the truth and the life. So I mean, if He is abiding in someone, I, I don't see how you can you can speak lies constantly. I realize some things. Sometimes we say things you know maybe we don't really mean. Sometimes we make promises we can't keep. Sometimes we forget what we're saying. And, and you know I, I've told people, yeah, I'll come look at this yard Monday. And then I'll remember it about Friday, and you know I'll have to call them and say I'm sorry. And by then they done found somebody else. But but you know sometimes that happens. Sometimes that happens. But but it's not not my intentions to do it. Some, most you know a lot of people they're they're habitual liars. It's their intentions to lie. They 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 want to lie just so they can lie to somebody else. And and that's I don't believe a believer. That's not that's not the characteristics of a believer because we have truth. We have truth. In us, he is the truth. He resides in us. Verse 36, which of you convinceth me of sin? If I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's word. Heareth God's words. He, ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. I mean, they're just, he just, he just very plain with them. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, shall we not... Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast the devil. I mean, see, they'll just, you know, they'll just tell anything to make him look bad. Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and ye do dishonor me. We talked about that last week, how, how he doth he done always that please the father. And that's not quoting it exactly, but he always pleased the father. He always done exactly what God wanted him to do. He always, always honored him. He said, I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. 
How about that? Hey. See? See, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life. He that keep, what did he say? If a man keep my saying, what's, what is his saying? What's he been saying? That he's God, that he is, that he is the truth, that he is the life, that you've got to come by him, through him. You've got to come his way. He shall never see death. That's, that's a sure way to, yeah, when the death he's talking about here is, it, it's, it's not just dying in your flesh. He's talking about that eternal. See, we, if you're saved, you, you'll, you'll, never, you'll never die. You'll never die. You know, like that old song, I'll never die, just be promoted. That's, that's kind of that's what he's talking about. We, we don't let, we, we, the body may die, but this body's temporal anyways. It, it was going to die. It was going to die anyways. It's born, this body's born to die. So it, it's going it's to fade away. It doesn't matter. So, so you, you want to make sure that you're in Christ. You want to make sure that you keep his sayings. Not, not, he's, not talking about, he's not talking about following laws and following, following ordinances. He, he's talking about what he, what the context of where he was, the fact that you've got to trust him. You gotta trust him. See, they are trusting in themselves. They're trusting in their religion. They're trusting what they think Abraham did. But he says, "You've got to keep what I've said. Forget, forget, forget what you said. You got to keep my sayings. You got to do what I've said." Then said the Jews unto him, "Now we know that thou hast the devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, if a man keep my sayings, he shall never taste death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead?" The prophets are dead. Who makest thou thyself? So what they're, they're, they're kind, of, kind of throwing this at him. Some of them didn't even believe in resurrection anyways. But, but what they're saying is, you, you said that we'll never die, but all, all Abraham's dead, the prophets are dead. You know, what, what, are you, what are you trying to do? Well, yeah, the body's gone. The body's gone, but, but they're, still, they're, still, they're still alive. They're still alive. They're still there. Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. Ye, yet ye have not known him, but I know him. If I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his sayings. See, they say, they say that they know God. They say that he is their God. But he said, ye have not known him. He said, you don't know him. He said, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, thou art not yet 50 years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Yeah, he did. I believe, I believe he did. Back there in Genesis 18, we, I mean, we're going to read the whole, if you want to get there. I mean, I know he's God, but, but if you want to earthly experience, I believe this is what is happening in Genesis chapter 18. <clears throat> When, when uh, those, uh, the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day, and he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. I mean, I, I, that's what we would call, you know, theologically speaking, a theophany. I think that's what it's called, something like that. And it's just, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the Lord. It's, it's Christ. This is who, because notice, if you, I mean, we, we won't read through the chapter because we don't have time. But, but just notice the times that he said, and the Lord said, and the Lord said, and the Lord said, and, and, and Abraham said, my Lord, my Lord. And then he says, and the Lord said, and the Lord said. You just read through that, Genesis chapter 18. I mean, who, what other Lord is there? See, Christ, we, I realize Christ, he's always been. He's God. This is just, this is just, uh, uh, this is Christ. Pre-incarnate Christ here before, before, before the cross, before, before he was ever born as a baby in a manger, he came here. That's what we believe. I believe that. You may not. I don't know, but I believe you do. But this is just, this, this was, there's no other Lord besides, besides the Lord. I mean, it's Christ. So he, he seen him. He, he knew Abraham. He knew Abraham better than them because he's the one that called Abraham out of the land of the earth, Chaldees. I mean, uh, everything Abraham, everything Abraham ever said about God, it came from God. I mean, because 
I mean, because Christ and, and the Father are one. It's what came from him. So when they say, hey, you know, thou art yet, not yet 50 years old, hast thou seen him? Yeah, yeah, he knew him. He knew Abraham. He knew exactly who he was. Jesus said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto you before Abraham was, I am. He said, I'll, I'll do you one better than that. He said, I, before Abraham ever was, I am. Who, what's that talking about? That's a, he's, I think he's, he's going back there to Exodus, Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? God said unto Moses, I am that I am. That, that's, who he, that's, that's the I am. That's, that, that shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. That's who he is. That's, that's, what he's been, that's what he spent this whole chapter trying to get them to see, that him and the Father are one, that they're the same, that he is God in the flesh. And, and so that's why he said, before Abraham was, I am. I, I believe that's where he was going with it. All they've done is talked about Moses and Abraham. And, and so, so the Lord's just, the Lord's just saying, yeah, yeah, I know Moses. I know Abraham. As a matter of fact, I was before Moses. That's what he's trying to get them to see. And they, did, they really didn't like it. Verse 59, Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. So here they are. I mean, they like the religious crowd. They like to throw rocks, apparently, because they came to him at the first of the chapter wanting to stone this woman. And uh, here they are at the end of the chapter. They want to stone him. So, uh, and that is what religious people like to do. <laughs> they like to throw rocks. So Jesus hid himself. He went out of the temple, went through the midst of them, so passed by. So that that that's that's that brings us down here to chapter nine, and I, I won't get in chapter nine. But isn't it amazing how how religion has not changed? It doesn't matter whether it's Judaism, it doesn't matter whether it's Christianity. You, you've got people that 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 are in their high places of religion, and they will not have what what thus saith the Lord. They they will go. They will take the scriptures and they will find verses. They will find something that some, some Old Testament prophets said. They'll find anything that they can find and they'll take it out of context and they will cause it to disagree with what the very I am said. The very one, Jesus, the one that's before Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, before, before Moses ever came about, the I am. They'll, they'll, find, they'll find words and, and just phrases, and they'll, they'll try to twist them and make them fit what they want instead of taking what he says. That, that is that verse 45, because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. There's no, I mean, no, no greater uh, summary of, of what religion thinks about Christ than that verse, really. I mean, I tell you the truth, and you believe me not. It doesn't matter, doesn't matter what people say. Doesn't matter what they do, uh, or what he says, or what what he said in his scripture. They they will walk all over what Christ said just to just to find something that suits their religion, something that suits where they are. Here and in chapter nine, we we'll see you see the same thing. You'll see a you you'll see he, he, chapter nine. I really a great chapter. I mean, I don't I don't want to get into it. But you see a picture of a salvation experience in a man, how that Christ here uh, works in this man's life, and how that religion, religion, and, and the religious system just is, is always, religion's just, it's, it's almost always against what, what Christ says. And that the reason being is, is because the same devil that's the father of of you know the sinner that we would look at and say, oh, that's a you know he might be a you know a sinner in all religions' eyes, but the same religious system's just as wicked uh, because it for the same reason. I mean, the the drunk drunk on the street or or the priest down at the you know 
down at the local whatever. The same, the same reason is because they are serving their father, the devil. They're, this is, they're, they're, they're walking in what they want. They're walking in their truth, their version, whatever version of it it is, whatever excuse they've got, whatever reason that they come up with. I mean, it, it doesn't matter if, 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 it's, if it's the bottle or if it's the sacraments. It's all, it's all, it's all trying to find some other way to, to ease the pain, some other way to push off the condemnation other than coming the right way through Christ, through what he says. It's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all basically the same because it all comes from the same devil. It's just, it's just like I said, it's wrapped up in a different, different package. So, and that's what he's trying to get these religious leaders to see, these Pharisees, is that, that they're, they are... They are following after, they're following after their own ideas, their own ways. But, but chapter 9, we'll, we'll look at that next week. It, it's just a great picture of, uh, of salvation, of how God works in a sinner's life and, and shows him, just, just get light and more light and just keep showing him uh, what, uh, who Christ really is. We'll, we'll stop there.
It's over.
Amen. All right. We'll go ahead and get service started this morning. And it's good to be in the Lord's house. Good to be saved. Amen. Amen. I thank the Lord for the Sunday school teaching, don't you? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I have uh, got a letter here I wanted to share with the church. And uh, it's from Brother Larry Wells. He, uh preached our revival meeting, and of course we support him as an evangelist. And uh, he said, trust all is well with you and your family and church family. Uh, sickness and heavy scheduling have hindered us from being more current with our thank you than you are receiving. Of course, I received this letter before we had actually left and went out of town, but I didn't have time to read it. Um, but it says, uh, um, but our hearts are very grateful for the wonderful opportunity of being with you all in revival services. Sometimes I marvel at the Lord's hand in placing us where he wants and when he wants us there. Your meeting was truly one of those special times when you just knew the Lord's voice was being heard uh, both by the preacher and by those who heard. Our deepest thanks for your kindness to us during the meeting. The room was such a comfortable place to rest. The meals were extremely good. The fellowship was such a blessing to Miss Wells and myself. And the love offering was exceptionally generous, which will be used for the Lord's glory and we especially thank you for honoring Sister Carolyn with a special basket and precious thoughtful gifts. We continually thank the Lord for such liberty in declaring the truth of his word. We are continuing to remember you all in our prayers and trust that you will remember us in your prayers as well. Yours in Christ, Brother Larry Wells. And uh, I, I've talked with Brother Wells on occasions. Uh, he's a very honest man. And if he didn't feel like the Lord had done anything at all, he'll just tell you. <laughs> he'll just say, I think I, I felt like it was hindered or I was hindered or, or the Lord's work was hindered. or I mean, he'll just say it. But uh, for him to say uh, what he said in this letter about... Uh, you know, the Lord having him here and working, uh, it, that, that means a lot. And uh, we did. We had a tremendous meeting, a great meeting. I really believe the Lord did some things for us. Amen. And uh, I, I, I urge you, listen, if you go through a meeting like that and nothing happens for you, uh, I urge you to seek the Lord. I urge you to seek the Lord. Uh, we should be able, if we're saved especially, we should be able to find help, especially when God's helping. 
when God's helping his man to preach, uh, when it's uh, one of those times you can just feel the word has liberty and the spirit of the Lord has liberty to move and work in the hearts and lives of people. And uh, for those that are unsaved, we pray for you that you'll be saved. It's the most important thing that you could ever do in this life is to know Christ, is to be born again and to know that, to know that you have uh, a relationship with the Lord. It's not so much just about escaping hell and, and saying, I've got a place in heaven. It's about having Jesus in your life, having a relationship with him. And all that's bonus, escaping hell and getting to go to heaven. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Good to see everybody this morning. Let's all stand. We'll receive the Lord's uh, tithes and offerings. And uh, Brother Adam, would you come? And Brother Ronnie, would you help this morning? And uh, amen. Brother Adam asked the blessing upon the Lord's offering today. Amen. Brother Mike, come on here.
Page number six.
you taking for? So much to praise him for, you see. He's been so good to me. And when I think of what he's done and where he has brought me from, I've got so much to so much to thank him for and I've got so much to thank him for so much to praise him for you see he's been so good to me and when I think of what he's done and where he has brought me from I've got so much for you see he has been so good to me and when I think of what he's done and where he has brought me from I've got so much to thank him for Enjoyed that, didn't you? Amen. 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 Y'all have anything on your heart you want to sing this morning? Okay, come right ahead. Amen. All right, pray for my wife as she sings. I couldn't find the paper, so forgive me. I got my phone here, but um, it's just the words. His heart was broken, mine was mended. <clears throat> he became sin, now I am clean. The cross he carried bore my burden. <clears throat> the nails that held him set me free. His life for mine, his life for mine, how could it ever be that he would die, God's son would die to save a wretch like me, what love divine. He gave his life for mine. <clears throat> his scars of suffering brought me healing. He shed his blood to fill my soul. His crown of thorns made me royalty. His sorrows gave me joy untold. His for mine, his life for mine, how could it ever be that he would die, God's son would die to save a wretch like me, what love divine, he gave his life for mine, he was despised despised and rejected stripped of his garments 
and oppressed. I am loved and accepted, and I wear a robe of righteousness. His life for mine, his life for mine. How could it ever be that he would die? God's son would die to save us. He gave his life for mine. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, that was a blessing, wasn't it? Amen. Amen. That's that's the gospel right there. Uh, he would give his life for me. And there's not a soul on the planet that can't make that statement. God so loved the world. That means everybody can say, He gave His life for me. Amen. Nobody's left out. Amen. Amen. Brother John, he's uh, wanting me and him to sing a song again this morning, Amazing Grace. We sang this during the revival meeting. And uh, <coughs> are you going to lead or you want me to lead? I want you to lead. <clears throat> you pray for us, okay? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieves. How precious did. That grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers, toils, and snares. I have already come his grace that brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home when we've been there ten thousand years bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. He makes me sound good. Amen. Praise the Lord. All that you do, do all to the glory of God. Amen. 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 It's not to the glory of man, it's all to the glory of God. Amen. Give Him the praise. We sing these songs of praise to our Lord. Amen. And uh, give Him thanks. Uh, for his goodness, amen, for his mercy, for his mercy. What a blessing uh, it is to be <clears throat> in God's house. And I want to, if you'll turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy, uh, chapter number 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> I really desire your prayers this morning.
the Lord would help us to uh, bring about this uh, thought. I got to thinking about this the other day. <clears throat> I'll be preaching in this chapter this morning, um, but for sake of time, I want to uh, just begin reading in verse number 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me uh, that uh, by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Salute Prisca and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus uh, greeteth thee, and uh, Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren, the Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. <clears throat> I want to look in this chapter and I was thinking the other day and I guess the, the burden from the Holy Spirit that... Uh, brought to my attention something that I already knew, but a lot of times you just, you don't think about this. But these are the last known words of the Apostle Paul that he wrote to Timothy. This was the last book, as far as I know, that the Apostle Paul penned down uh, before that he would go and have his life taken from him on Nero's chop block. Uh, Paul knew for some time that his life uh, would be taken from him. The Spirit of the Lord had revealed it to him that he would. Uh, he knew uh, in different places that he went that he would be bound. The Spirit of God revealed it to him. And the Apostle Paul, I believe if you read more in this chapter, and we will, you'll see that he knew that his time was at hand. Uh, as a matter of fact, when you uh, read uh, in this chapter, you read uh, that Paul uh, lived in the light of the coming of the Lord. The very first verse he said to Timothy, he said, I, I charge thee, and I want you to remember this. This is his last words to this uh, young convert, his son in the faith, if you want to say that. I, I don't know exactly how old that Timothy was, but uh, he was quite younger than the apostle Paul. But Timothy was a, a young pastor. He'd gotten saved underneath the, the Apostle Paul. And one of the very few that did not uh, forsake him in his latter days, those that were close to him. Uh, Paul said, uh, I believe in the earlier parts uh, of uh, Timothy, that all that it were in Asia had forsaken him except it was for the house of Onesiphorus, whom he mentions here in chapter number four. He had felt like all of those that they had one time had fellowship with, that he had reached, that he had, he had preached to. If there's one thing that's disheartening for a man of God is to know that he has put time into the spiritual life of people trying to uh, first see them saved and then to see them grow, to only have them turn against him. 
and that happens many times in the ministry. I've known many of the pastor that uh, people have stood with them at the first, but as time went on, as time went on, they began to forsake the man of God and, and turn from uh, the preaching that he tried to give unto them. And here Paul was no different. He is our great example, he, but he, he lived in light of the Lord's coming. He told Timothy, he said, I, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this charge that he gave to Timothy, he wanted him to know that God is listed and the Lord Jesus is listed. And they're both watching. And he said, who shall judge the quick and the dead? That's the saved and the lost. At his appearing and his kingdom. The quick at his appearing, the saved at his appearing, at the rapture and the dead in his kingdom after the millennial kingdom at the great white throne judgment, the Lord God will judge. He'll judge us for the works we did while we were here on earth. He'll judge them because their names are not written in the book of life. But he told Timothy, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That is the way that a man of God must continue in the ministry. He must preach the word. That's his goal. That's his life. That's his ministry. That's what he's called to do. Amen. Is to preach the word. And he said, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, shall be turned unto fables. He told them, the time will come, they'll not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves, teachers having itching ears. Now, Paul lived in the light of that time. It was happening in his time. Look in verse number six. Paul said, for I'm now ready. I'm now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. He said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. You see, Paul lived in light of the appearing of our Lord. What we're going to do, how we're going to live our Christian life and to be ready for his coming. Paul said, I'm now ready. The time of my departure is at hand. Listen, whether it was the rapture or whether he was going out by way of death, he knew that his time was at hand. And notice the life that he lived. He said, I have fought a good fight. These are the last words of the Apostle Paul. I mean, has he got anything more to say that he could say about his life than I have fought a good fight? Think about the life that you and I have lived for the Lord and we're going to come down to the place one day we'll have said our last goodbyes, amen? Can we look back and say, I have fought a good fight. I have fought a good fight. I want to fight that good fight, don't you? I want to be a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I have finished my course. Paul knew that his race was run. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. All the way through, Paul lived for the Lord. And he knew that he was going to be standing before the Lord and uh, the righteous judge, the righteous judge. Now look at the world that Paul lived in. I'll get back to some of what Paul said uh, about uh, uh, living in the light of the Lord's coming in just a moment. But the world that Paul lived in, 
Because there are those that say, well, my, you know, they, they use the world as an excuse. Well, my life, you know, if it wasn't for, if it wasn't for my husband, I could live for God. Or if it wasn't for my wife, I could live for God. Or if, if, I, if I'd had a, a better start, uh, or, or if, if things were going better for me, you know, if I just, if I had a little more money, if my life was a, a little easier, I could have maybe lived for God a little more. Well, I mean, and we use these, these excuses. No, you can live for God regardless of the world around you. Paul said uh, that he uh, lived, listen, uh, in, at the time of the Lord's appearing and his kingdom in light of that. And he said in verse uh, number six, I'm now ready. But the world he lived in, he said, the time will come they'll not endure sound doctrine. People not enduring sound doctrine. Uh, after their own lust, heaping to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And we're living in that day. We're living in that day more than even what the Apostle Paul was living in that day. Now they had false Christ, false teaching, false doctrine, but he said the time will come. In other words, he knew there was an even greater time. The time like the days of Noah, the time like the days of Lot. They will not endure sound doctrine. You know what we need in this generation more than we need anything else? Sound doctrine. Sound doctrine. You know, when Paul the apostle told uh, Timothy in verse 5, watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. You know what he meant to tell him? <coughs> when he was saying this, and he, and he was saying it, out in the community, cry out, cry aloud, that form of sound doctrine. Amen? Now I want to tell you something. We have gotten used to doing it within the walls of the sanctuary. But I think if Paul was here or if John the Baptist was here or even our Lord was here, they'd probably be down in the middle of town lifting up their voice and letting all the hereabouts hear them say what is sound concerning the faith. What is sound doctrine? And that's what he told him. Make full proof of thy ministry. Do what you can to lift up sound doctrine. Amen. The time will come. They will not endure sound doctrine. They're not going to come here to hear it. Maybe we should take it there. The time will come. They will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You see, the world wants to be religious but there's only so many things they want to hear. And there's a certain way they want to hear them. Amen? I, I say, you know, there are people that'll say, uh, preach the truth. I want the truth. I want to hear the truth until they get the truth. And then when they get the truth, they don't like it so much. They don't like it so good. Amen? But sound doctrine that, that, that it's not worldly, it's not, it's not lustful, it's not fleshly, amen. It doesn't have holes in it. I'm talking about sound Bible doctrine, amen. Amen. I'm talking about not just going from one verse on what I believe, but many verses, amen, many things in the Bible that let us know what God expects out of our life as a child of God and what God means when he says, you must be born again. It's more than just one, two, three, repeat after me. I know that. I know the Spirit of God must deal with a man's heart or a woman's heart. Without the drawing of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, 
No man can come to me except the Father which sent me draws him. You can't do away with that. Amen? And when a person gets to the place where they're of a broken and a contrite heart, where they're sorry for their sin and sorry for being a sinner, then maybe they can get saved. Amen? Amen. They, they get tired of being lost. Get tired of the fact that they're dying in their sin and going to hell. Amen. Get, get fearful of God of a fact like that. Hey, then somebody can get born again. Amen. Listen, God will still deal with a sinner and give grace to the sinner. God loves the sinner. He'll draw them and convict them and make them know the need that they have in their soul. God deals with people that way. The Bible lets us know that. Listen, but the time will come they'll not endure sound doctrine. Paul said this is the world he lived in. But he told Timothy, he told Timothy, preach the word. Timothy, don't change. They're going to, they're going to, the time's going to come. They'll not endure sound doctrine. I'll tell you what, even in the days of Paul's ministry, I'd say he saw things change quite a bit inside the church house. He had to go back to the Corinthians and say, I told you this wasn't right. And I told you this is how things are to be done. He had to remind them over and over again, even how they're supposed to live, how they wasn't supposed to live in the flesh. They wanted to commit adultery and everything be okay. They wanted to steal thief and everything be okay. They wanted to still lie like Brother Brandon was teaching about and everything still be okay. And then he said, you can't live that kind of a life and be saved. They that live like that, they'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's what he told them in Corinthians. And he reminded them of how the church operated, how the operation of God worked. Everything he had to go over. Why? Because they wanted to change. They wanted to change. The time will come. They will, shall not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap. They build their own religion. They build their own doctrine. They build their own beliefs around what they want to believe, what they want to hear. Just as long as it doesn't rub against their flesh. That was how the world Paul lived in. They shall turn away their ears from the truth, shall be turned unto fables. Look at verse 10. He said, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Even at one time, Titus had left him and went to Dalmatia. What about that? But Demas had forsaken him. <laughs> Cretan had forsaken him. That's the world Paul lived in. Look at verse 14. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Look at verse 15. Paul told Timothy, of whom be thou aware also. In other words, Timothy, you beware of that man. For he hath greatly withstood our words. He hath greatly withstood our words. Amen. He was one of them liberal religious people. Amen. They wanted to claim salvation, but they always withstood that strong conservative truth. Amen. Amen. 
I know I'm telling it right this morning. He said, He has greatly withstood our words. I've run into this type before. I've had them stick their finger right in my face, just like this. And you know what? For, for what? For what? For telling the truth. Just for reading the book. Just for reading scripture and making this statement on what the book said. Amen. I ain't got my own statement. I ain't got nothing to say on my own. I don't have anything more to say than what this book says. Amen. I know it ain't going to help you nor me nor anybody else for me to say anything other than what God put in his word. Paul said that they withstood me. Beware of them. He said, at my first answer, no man stood with me. Can you imagine living in a world that nobody stood with you? But all men forsook me, just like they did on the night that Christ was taken. They forsook our Lord. I pray, God, that it may not be laid to their charge. Why? Because some of them genuinely was saved. Mark, John Mark, Paul calls for him afterward. In verse 11, he said, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. That's the Mark that had left him at one time in the ministry. Paul knew there was something in John Mark that was real. And he's told him, he said, bring him. Timothy, bring him. Bring him with you. He's profitable. He is profitable. Only Luke is with me. That beloved physician. Paul lived in a cold world. Listen, he told uh, Timothy to come. And he, he told him, he said in verse 21, do thy diligence to come before winter. And I, I, I did some, some research on that. What did it mean when Paul said, uh, do thy diligence to come before winter? Now you got to remember where he was. He was over there uh, in Rome. He wasn't up in Russia or northern Canada. He's in a place, I don't know if they even see snow that much. But it gets very cold, and it's very windy, and it's very rainy during the winter season. And I could just imagine sitting in a drafty, wet, stone cell with not enough clothes on to keep you warm, and the cold air start blowing in and the mist and the moisture and the rain coming in day and night and shivering constantly from the cold of being inside of something that more resembled a cave than anything else. Try to come before winter. He lived in a cold world, locked up. He told him, uh, in verse 13, he said, The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee. Bring that cloak that I could wrap myself in. Look at this. And the books, that was the rolls, the scrolls that he had. Are you listening? The copies. But then he said, but especially the parchments. If you don't bring nothing else, even if you don't get the cloak, bring the parchment. You know what the parchment was, don't you? It was that sheepskin that was written on the Holy Scripture. And it's a perfect picture of the Lamb, the Word. Having that in his life no doubt made him feel closer to Christ than anything else in this world. I could imagine Paul sitting there 
sitting there in that cold cell and just thinking, if I had that lamb skin that had the word of God written on it. You see, Jesus is the lamb and he is the word made flesh. Amen. Oh, <laughs> Lord, I come in the volume of a book just to have that sitting on his lap reading the scroll, the word of God, amen, having that, oh, that it warmed his soul more than anything else. What that would do for the apostle Paul to have that parchment again in his lap. Hey, he wanted God's word and the presence of Christ more than anything in this world. Oh, my the last words of Paul bring especially the parchments. Living in light of the second coming, I thought about this, the seasons in the life of Paul. There he was talking about a winter season coming up. A season of forsakenness. All the men that had forsaken him. Look what he said in verse 3. For the time will come. That word time, it also interprets season. Look what Paul told him. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. All the seasons of your life, Timothy. Timothy. You're going to have many. Preach the word. No matter what season you're in, no matter if they're forsaking you, whether you're in jail and you're cold and without your books, whatever that it is, amen, in whatever season, the Lord, he said, the Lord, not in verse 17, notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. When everybody else forsook me, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known. Think if the apostle Paul had given up in any season of his life, that preaching may not have been fully known. Think of what we would have been without or maybe what the Lord would have had to had someone else Bring the rest of it. There was a time where he said, and that all Gentiles might hear, in verse 17, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Now, I'm not sure. The mouth of the lion could be one of two things. It could have either been some great trial that Paul felt he was facing or going to face, or there are those that have written, and I may be leaning toward this. He was a Roman citizen, and at death, many times they would take them to the arenas and have the lions just tear them apart. And that's how they died. Maybe Paul was saying, I was delivered from that death. I was delivered from that death. Listen, the Lord uh, didn't have plans for Paul to be delivered or to be torn apart by lions. Amen. He had enough spiritual lions in his life biting on him and ripping on him, don't you think? But he said, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lions and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. He still believed in the preservation of his soul that no matter what his flesh had faced, the Lord was going to preserve him unto his kingdom. Paul knew he was going to heaven. 
he told them in one place, I believe it was in Philippians, find it. If I'm not mistaken, Philippians. Yeah, Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. Here's what Paul said. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart, and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Paul knew at that one time that he was staying here, but he had a desire to depart. But he knew that Christ would be magnified in his life or in his death. Whether he lived or whether he died. So Paul's telling Timothy in chapter 4, his last dying words. He's telling him about the place that he lives, how to endure all those that had forsaken him, how that Christ always had stood with him, how to look to the Lord, what meant more to him than anything. For I'm now ready. Are you now ready? There's a message in that one thought, for I am now ready. He didn't say, I'm getting ready. He said, I'm now ready. I am now ready. Right now, this instant, if the Lord was to call me home, everything's all right between me and him. I'm saved and I know I'm saved by his blood, kept and preserved by his hand, by his power. I've lived for him. I've fought a good fight. I finished my course. There wasn't anything that I left undone. Think about that one for a while. I have kept the faith. Can't be a Christian one day and then choose a few days not to be and then come and decide to be it, you know, and just bounce back and forth. I have kept the faith. He wasn't keeping it to be saved. He kept it because he was saved. And he said, the love of Christ constraineth me. His love for Christ, but also the love Christ had for him. Amen. I want you to stand this morning.
What would your last words be? You say, well, I've not done much. It's too late. You know, the Lord spoke a parable. There were those that were hired by an husbandman first thing in the morning for a penny. They worked and labored that morning. They worked and labored the heat of the day till almost the day was over. And then that husbandman, there was someone else come along and he hired him in for a penny. Even though he didn't work as long as these, he received the same reward. It's the relationship that you have. It's the fact that you're laboring in his field. You're one of his. Amen? Whether you've been doing it 50 years or whether you're just now getting started, it's never too late. Never too late. Play something. The altar's open. If you need to come and pray, the Heavenly Father's speaking to your heart about something. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we love you. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your words. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your people. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. God that speaks to our heart. I thank you, God, for your eternal word. Help us, dear Lord, to keep the faith, to run our race. God, to do what you saved us to do and called us to do. Lord, nothing more, nothing less. God, help us to be faithful. Faithful to you. Lord, we know you'll stand with us. Help us, Father, I pray. Speak to hearts in a way that only you can. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The altar's open. If you need to pray. How about it? Beautiful shore, my Lord, song of the blessed, and our spirit shall sorrow no more. On the sun for the blessing of rest. In the sweet by and by. What a day. What a rest. What a place. What a Savior. Amen. That's good. Amen. Praise God. Jesus is going to make heaven shine. Do you know that? Amen. Amen. He is the light of that city. Praise God. Amen. Anybody got a word before we dismiss? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Amen. Brother John, tell them what you learned in Sunday school. Amen. That's that's good, ain't it? He said, I'm learning something all the time. I said, that's good. That's what's supposed to happen. Amen. We need to be reminded of that, don't we? Amen. Remind me not to lie. Amen. Be truthful. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's right. Amen. All right. I think we had a, an anniversary we need to sing here for Sister Kaylee, at least Sister Kaylee. And we'll sing it for Brother Ben, too. Did we have any birthdays or other anniversaries that we missed? Elena had her birthday. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Brother Dave, 29 years. Wow. Hey, you can to see photos of him with a black mustache and black hair. Amen. You can see the Italian in him. Amen. Anyone else? All right, let's sing happy birthday to Elena, and then we're going to sing happy anniversary uh, to Ben and Kaylee and to Brother Dave. Amen. All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary, God bless you. Happy anniversary to you. Amen. Fellowship, come back tonight, okay? At six, you're at liberty.